Okay. What? What'd you say? Okay, we're starting. We will pray at the end. I'll pray in my prayer as we begin. Uh, Lord, just thank you uh, for the chance to go, to you, go through your word as we enter in, um, continue in the book of Esther. Lord, just ask that you speak to us. Um, Lord, though your name's not mentioned in this book, uh, we see your hand all over it, Lord. So we just uh, thank you for that. It's the same thing in our lives, Lord. Uh, sometimes we don't see what you're doing, but Lord, you tell us that you're continually working in our lives. We just thank you for that. Lord, for those who are traveling around this time uh, in, from this church, Lord, just ask that you to keep them safe, uh, protect them, Lord, and uh, we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So just by way of review, uh, just to kind of give you a little backdrop to Esther, again, we don't know the author necessarily. It's written to those who remained in Persia or around Babylon. Um, really, first few chapters are, are about the threat to the Jews and how they are set up to basically uh, by Haman. And then we, from chapters 5 to 10, we talk about the triumph of the Jews. It's really contained in Esther's courage, Haman's contempt, and Mordecai's counsel. This is done in Shushan, which is one of the capitals. Uh, we also This is, takes place in about 10 to 12 year period from 483 to 473. Falls in place in the middle of the book of Ezra between chapter six and seven. Really more notably, it's between Zerubbabel's 50,000 that returned to, uh, to Jerusalem and the extra individuals that Ezra bring. Um, so it's between those is when this takes place and what is it all about? Again, like I said in my prayer, there's no really mention of God, but what he does throughout this book is reveal his power, his sovereignty. Sovereignty is the idea of ruling and overruling. Um, if you want a good illustration of God's sovereignty, just really read the first four books of Daniel. Um, that gives you a good picture where um, Nebuchadnezzar uh, has a dream and it's interpreted and basically he tries to take it upon himself to well he creates a statue and everybody to worship and God gets a hold of that guy um, and makes him to the point of Daniel 4 where he basically gives a testimony of what God did in his life and how he got him to a point where he was confessing him as God um, and then we have the providence of God also seen. Providence is a, a compound word. It just means before seen. So the idea of seen before. And obviously this is from God's perspective. And God knows. Um, we could also label it as the invisible working of God. Um, and what he's doing is protecting and preserving his people. Preservation is a huge word in this book and the idea that he's preserving his people. Um, he also, when we talked last week, we brought up the idea that God makes a similar promise to us as Christians. Um, he says, and we know all things, and those things necessarily could be good or bad, but what God promises is that they'll work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And again, what we'll see as we go through this book, is God a hand all over this. Last week, when we went through chapter one, we had a few feasts. We kind of really got a behind the scenes look at the situation they were in. The king, as it were, who, um, better known as Xerxes, uh, basically is trying to strum up a group to go and attack the Greeks. And so he has a party for six months, and then he, even after that, has another party for seven days. In those seven days, um, these parties were known for their drinking. Um, he basically was comparing his wife and asked her to come, and um, because she was beautiful, present herself to the nobles, and, um, and she refused to do that. 
Some people believe, we didn't talk about this much, but again, it could have been the idea of just unveiling herself. And it would have been dishonored, dishonorable to do in that culture, to have your wife unveil herself before these men. So she refused to do it. Because of that, the council got together and decided to kick her out of the queenship and make a plan to basically find another queen. Um, and what happens is we get to chapter two and it's been about four years. And what, what accounts for that three to four years is the fact that they do go to war. Um, he leads a war a campaign against the Grecians and Greeks and it does not bode well for him. I think Plateo and Salamis are the two wars, big wars in that. And he brings 200,000 men over 100 ships, and it, again, does not go well for him. So he's um, pretty upset, and that's where we find him in chapter 2. And so let's start there. Let's read. Let's read a few verses here, and then we'll get into it. It says, uh, after these things... Verse 1 of chapter 2, when the wrath of King Azarus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done and what she had, dec had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai, the Hege, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. So after these things, again, after the campaign against the Greeks, unsex, unsuccessful campaign against the Greeks, um, so... And he comes back and it says he remembers Vashti. And that's kind of longing for Vashti. He has, and so he's rethinking this whole decision about putting her out of the queenship. Servants know as soon as Vashti got appointed back to queen that it was probably off with their heads. So they thought better. Let's continue with the idea of having a Miss Persia contest. And that's what they did. Remember, he covered 127 different provinces. And so what they do is gather up all the beautiful women across the land. Um, most of them are believed to have done this not voluntarily. voluntarily right? They were basically taken. Um, um, some might have wanted to be queen. Others understood that if you weren't picked, we'll talk about what the ramifications were, of that were. But again, these servants are trying to cover their, um, cover their situation. And so they gather all these women. Some people believe that it would have been up to, well, Josephus, a Jewish historian, says there's about, is he a Roman or I think he's a Jewish historian, but he said there was about 400 women that they gathered this first time. Um, and what would happen is they would be placed in these women's quarters. Um, really, it would be called a harem at that point. And uh, in the c custodian of, they say Haggai, he's a eunuch. Eunuch is a castrated man. And again, they did that for purposes of that these men would not mess with the wives and the concubines of the king. And... And it was decreed at that point, if the young woman pleased the king, they would be selected queen. And it says at the end of this in chapter, verse 4, it says he pleased the king. Again, he found Solomon in his harem. He was basically um, boistering up his harem. Um, and notice a lot of times he follows the counsel of his people. But again... We have to take a step back when we see some of these things. A lot of polygamy happens in the uh, Old Testament. Again, what the Bible records is the truth. It doesn't give affirmation necessarily 
to the practices that are being done in the Old Testament. And what we see with polygamy, multiplying of wives, it does not go well in any family. Um, and it's not what God intended. And it won't go well here, um, especially for a lot of these women. Because when these women got, if they did not get selected, it did not mean they get to return home. What would happen is they would be still left in the harem. And with that, they basically were taken care of for the rest of their life and maybe would have a chance to be called upon again by the king. But they couldn't remarry and really meant that they didn't have a, a real relationship from that point on. They would be married to the king but they might never see him again, in a sense. So pretty unfortunate for them, and so that's why you could see, you imagine, and then they're taking all these women out of these different cultures, different provinces around. All that, and then we have, and what I, I labeled, what I titled this is Characters Placed, because we're going to have where Esther comes in, where Mordecai comes in, and the situation in which Haram, Haram um, Haman, um, well, we, we'll get to that next week, but Hiram basically moves in to basically try to take the Jews out. Um, so we have Mordecai introduced here in verses 5 through 8. Let's read it. It says, In Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it was when the king's... Con com well, we'll just stop right there. Um... Again, we have Mordecai introduced. Again, we have to recognize that some of these individuals who are in this area are still in disobedience. A lot of them should have gone back to Jerusalem, back to their homeland. Um, even he made this promise to his great-great-grandfather, the, the guy named Kish, who was taken by with Jeconiah. We know this happened in 597. Part of that group was Ezekiel. He would have been in that crew. Um, there's three different captivities, um, 605, 597, and ultimately 586. Um, and so he would have, this was the middle one. And what the Lord had promised to them in the book of Jeremiah, he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The good figs represent the exiles I sent from Judah to the land of the Babylonians. Remember, Jeremiah was recommending that they go to Babylon to protect themselves because eventually he would bring them out. If not, if they stayed, they would get slaughtered. Or worse, would ha well, was, other things would happen. He goes on in verse 6, says, I will watch over and care for them, and I will bring them back here again. And he's done that with the 50, 50 60,000 that came back with Zerubbabel and Ezra. But these group did not. <laughs> I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. Um, so you have Mordecai somewhat along with some of his people in disobedience, but yet there are some godly characteristics of Mordecai. It, obviously, he adopted his younger cousin. So, a lot of people believe there's about 15 years between them. Uh, he, Hadassah, which is Esther, gets married, I think, at the age of 26. I don't know how they figure out these genealogies, but that's when she becomes queen. Um, Hadassah means myrtle. Esther means star. A lot of these individuals would get um, Persian names. Esther is a Persian name, just like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, got Babylonian names, named after gods, um, their gods. Um, it says she was lovely and beautiful, and that means, you know, modern terms, she was a babe, right, in both form. Actually, in the Greek, in the Hebrew, it means in form and features. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, even in these situations, the world takes advantage of beauty, right? And, you know, it's not, you know, we need to be mindful of that. Um, some of us don't have to worry about it. 
I, I'm not really worried about it, just to let you know. Um, so, and those kind of things. But again, that's exactly what happens here. Can you imagine these young ladies being taken with, again, the promise of one being a queen, but the rest being stuck in a harem as concubine the rest of their lives, um, unfortunately. Um, but what we'll find out about Esther is her beauty extends to her insides. Um, we'll identify kind of really, as I go through the study, just some godly characteristics of her. And again, we don't really know a lot about, we can only see by their actions. We don't know, right? They don't call on the name of the Lord. They don't call on God. God's, again, name's never mentioned. Um, you see some things Mordecai does, who's faithful, and biblical principles that you say the same thing, we'll say the same thing about Esther. There's biblical principles there. And yet God will use these individuals as tools to preserve his people because they'll, be, they'll stand in right places when they need to. And you'll see that with her. And there'll be some favor granted to her. It just reminds me of Joseph. Uh, he was put in all these bad circumstances, but yet you see God's favor on him in front of some of these Egyptians and different groups, right? He was always um, selected out or recognized as somebody you could put, you could trust to put people under. Um, you'll see the same thing with Esther. Um, again, many women were gathered, most not voluntarily, but grabbed, um, yet she stood out amongst them. Let's read I stopped in verse, verse 8. Let's read a few verses before I go on. Uh, let's just finish this up and then we'll go from there. It says, uh, verse 8, it says, So it was when the king's command and decree w were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel under the custody of Haggai, the es that Esther also was taken to the king's palace and to the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Now the young women pleased him. This young, sorry. Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor. So he was readily gave beauty preparations to her. Besides her allowance, the seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. Esther had not revealed her people, of or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what had happened to her. Each young woman's turn came to go, came to go into King Azarias after she had completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of their preparation apportioned, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned the second house, to the second house of the women, to the custodia of Shagaz, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. So let's go there from there. And uh, again, we have these ladies gathered up. We have this special favor being given to Esther. She stands out amongst um, all these women. Um, the idea of pleased, it pleased him. It's the idea of lifted up grace before someone's face. Um, and really the idea of just being a character being shown here. Um, and this kind of goes to what the Bible says in 1 Peter 3, for women specifically, do not let your adornment, adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold or putting on apparel, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. And you'll see that with her. Um, in the midst of this, she's given a secret that she's not to pass on. She keeps this secret. Um, she was not to reveal her people or her family. 
We do not know why it's not tell, told of us. We can only imagine that they were probably not favored before these people's eyes. Um, you know, even she even keeps a secret even after being selected as queen. Um, what this also shows, what you know, is that she has some self-control over her tongue. Right, and you see that with her, she's she's what we call verbal restraint. She has some verbal restraint, and you know that could help each and every one of us uh, when we talk about the tongue and what it can, what the damage it can cause. There's a great passage on that, and that's found in James three. Right, uh, it even talks in the first part of that is, hey, don't not not many of you guys should be teachers because you're going to be held to a higher standard. Um, you need to watch that. And then it goes on to say, you know, the tongue can cause all sorts of issues. And if you can contain the tongue, then you can contain the rest of the body. So you have that. She has that. She's not revealing any secrets, even after she's selected as queen. Um, and so until the time comes where she needs to, and we know if you have read through the book of Esther when that happens. She's uh, charged by Mordecai not to reveal this. Two different times we see that in verse, verse 10 and verse 20. Again, he understood that it could have some bad implications if it's revealed that she is a Jew. Um, and again, you see the fact that Esther has a, you know, a humble respect for authority. She respects the uh, man who raised her, her cousin, 15-year-old older cousin. So uh, you also see Mordecai being a, a father figure here. He's pacing every day before es to check on Esther's welfare, exactly what's going to happen to her. Um, and so you see that concern in his. And then it goes on to say, um, now when the turn came for Esther, the stepdaughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Azuerus into the royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tibeth in the seventh year of, the, of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in the sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. Okay, so what happens? Each of them have a turn. I think there's a movie called One Night Before the King made about Esther. Um, again, uh, this is after completing 12 months of preparation. And they basically went there in the mor evening until morning. This would include, unfortunately, sexual relations. Um, they would then be created, be concubines would be a wife. Um, they would be a wife. And it says, you know, if God, if the king did not select them, they would be moved to another building where all the wives would stay. Um, and again, it would be pretty tragic for that individual. Um, in this 12-month preparation, they are told that they could bring anything they desire that might please the king, um, whatever they desired. Uh, and so they had, again, a whole pantry for whatever they wanted to, they, whatever they wanted to bring that they think they would be selected by him. And yet it's 12 months, and I was wondering why by the 12 months, um, some people shared the idea they didn't want the king to be accused of having children with them. So the 12 months would be that period where they would know that, you know, the king. Um, that's some speculation. I, I thought that was a pretty good thing because it was after that. He would only have children with the queen. Um, how they controlled that, I don't know. Um, so, and if that didn't happen, I don't know what they did. So, but, you know, and so even these women would not have a chance to have children either apart from their family, stuck in this building. Know, they're taken care of, but I imagine, you know, just because you're taken care of physically doesn't mean there's all sorts of... It's just kind of tragic, in a sense. Um, and so, 
if they're not picked. So they're desperate to obviously be picked, um, so they would spend the night with the king, um, and they would then confirm their marriage there, consummate their marriage, um, and if they weren't picked, they would return to that second house. And he even gives you the name of that, another eunuch who was in charge of that group. Um, you know, so they would remain in that harem unless called on forever to the night. Um, again, they wouldn't have a chance to remarry or a real relationship or even return to their family. Um, there is, you know, well, then we have Esther who gets this opportunity um, before he gets, she gets this opportunity. It tells us that Esther obtained favor from all who met her. And, you know, we can just imagine the characteristics of this young lady. I mean, everybody seemed to be pleased with her. Um, she's probably unselfish, real. She's genuine. Um, there's a proverb that says, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on your, the tablet of your heart, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. And that's what you see in her life. So about the 10th month, this would be considered December of 479, 478. Um, again, this is, remember it mentions in the first part of this book that it's in the third year that Azarias has this party. So that's why we know it's, it records here in the seventh year. That's the four-year gap. And again, that goes along with Herodotus was an individual who wrote about a lot of these wars and what occurred in these wars. And it's pretty coincidental. We know it's not coincidence. That that gap is also mentioned in some of his things and the fact that it, there wasn't a queen mentioned and all that stuff. And so... Again, um, we have that. And that's just outside, re outside sources of the Bible that confirm the book of Esther. And I tell you that because some people attack this book for its historicity. historicity. Um, not to, recently, I don't know how recently, but maybe in the last couple decades, they found a guy named Meredith, Meredith who they think is Mordecai, um, a, a official, and those kind of things. And so... Um, there's a, 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 he's a doctor, I don't know what he's a doctor of, but I like this guy. His name is Dr. Robert Wilson. About a lot of these individuals, and this really happened in the last 19th and 20th century, where people were trying to get high, scholars were basically trying to get rid of some of these books as not being factual. And so, well, I like what he said. It says, in the name of scholarship and for the sake of truth and righteousness, it is time to call a halt on all those who presume to a knowledge which they do not possess in order to cast reproach upon an ancient writer as to whose sources of information and knowledge of the facts they must be ignorant and whose statements they cannot possibly fully understand nor successfully contradict. And I like what he said. He basically says, you know, they not, do not know what they're talking about. And having read a lot of the rebuttals on the fact that there's the culture is explained relatively well in this book. Not relatively well, it's explained well. Um, and so, again, giving credence to this was being, this was written and should be part of the canon. Um, sorry to go on that little tangent, but there's a lot being, and this really, we could have an, uh, a lot of books have tried to, you know, they've tried to refute. Um, you know, they tried to take out the whole book of Genesis. How have they done that with evolution? Right? They just try to take out God's witness of, you know, what man has not witnessed of creation and tried to do it, explaining it by some un incredible, incredibly flawed system. Um, and so, and you'll see that with individuals, with scholars trying to get rid of some of these things, but yet, Right. Every time they dig up something, it kind of goes in line with what the Bible has declared. So it usually, what well, never contradicts what the Bible says about situations. So with that, going back, you have, again, Esther, her turn. Um, she gets advice. She, so she, you see she has a teachable spirit. You see some wisdom on her ha behalf. She 
Some people would look at this and like, maybe she doesn't care to win approval by this king. So she's like, I'm not bringing nothing. Um, or, but we know because she seeks the counsel of the person that's put in charge of her and in charge of all the ladies. She's basically, hey, what do I bring? And he basically says, you don't need to bring anything. Um, and that all obviously works because it says that she obtained favor, grace and favor more than any of the other women before the king. And that's a sad statement anyways, other women. I mean, he's again mentioning all the different, up to 400 ladies. Um, but you, knew, you do see, as we've gone through this, that her inner attractiveness, despite her surroundings, and God uses her because of this, and will eventually use this to help preserve her people. And you see, at the end of this, she's made queen. They actually set a royal crown on her head, and they can make a holiday. Holiday just means rest for the day that she's selected queen. Then, you know, in a lot of stories we'd have, and they're happily ever after. Um, obviously, King Azawaris is not happily ever after. He then collects a second group of women to come and just to boister more of his harem, um, even though he's already picked a king. And you see that starting in verse 19. Let's read the rest of this. And we'll see Mordecai and his, what God uses him to do to help protect his people. When virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Big Then and Teresh, I was really trying to look for a joke on those two names. You know, terrorist and big, I don't know, I was going with something, I couldn't find it. Okay. You've come up with one, let me know. Doorkeepers became furious and sought to lay hands on King Azarias. Lay hands was not in the like Pentecostal way of praying for somebody. It's the idea of executing an individual. Just understand that. Um, so the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed and both were hanged on a, on a gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. And so we have the, basically the detection by Mordecai about this plot. Um, unfortunately, we, in the first part of this, you again, I'll mention the, he has virgins gathered a second time, again, to increase his harem. He's probably pretty distraught still about his loss. And he's finding solemn in his harem. Um, um, and again, he doesn't stop even though he has already selected a queen. Um, we have Mordecai at this point sitting at the king's gate. And that's the idea that he has some official position. He has been probably by the influence of Esther. And so he's made, um, again, he's got this position. And in this position, and he, again, you see God kind of orchestrating this whole thing. In this position, he, he hears of a plot by the big fan in Teresh, who are doorkeepers. We don't know why they made this plot, maybe because of the disposion, dispelling of Vashti. I, I don't know. Maybe their gal didn't get picked. Who knows? Um, but they um, want to execute the king. And so, um, but Mordecai finds out, and kind of according to the principle of 1 Peter 2.17, it says, fear God, honor the king. And that's what he does. And imagine this wasn't probably an easy decision for him. This is a king that he probably has taken them, his people, into captivity. Um, he's known this since his great-great-grandfather. Um, and uh, so he can't be really excited, but yet he informs Esther. Esther shares this with the king in Mordecai's name. And then Mordecai is rewarded. Nah, that's not exactly what happens, right? Um, it's printed down, yet um, I don't know why. We do know why looking back at the story. 
because basically the king's going to have a sleepless night, open up the records and realize that this guy was not rewarded for what, for saving the king's life. And they're going to throw a party for him. Um, but what does happen is they hear about this plot, he investigates it, and he confirms that it's true. And what happens to these individuals? They're hung on, on a gallows, which interesting verbiage. Um, this not necessarily what they would do, what is believed to be, they basically would sharpen the end of a log and they would impale these individuals on it. Um, if you've seen Braveheart, you've seen a scene where that, that happens. That's kind of the idea. That's how they would, um, they would usually create these posts, and that gallows just means posts, and they would impale them on there. So um, why you needed to know that, I don't know. That's just how they um, executed individuals. Um, what's interesting after this, and I haven't gone far enough to look into what, exactly what is occurring here, but we do have somebody promoted, but it's not for a little while, and that is Haman there in verse 3, 1. And he's an Agagite, which is another interesting story, but we're not going to get into that today. Um, what we are going to do is kind of, what do we get from this passage? And, you know, I've been hinting at it the whole time. Really, the book of Esther is all about God's hand at work despite not being mentioned or given credit to those things. Um, and it really, it's the idea that God is at work at all time, even if it's not apparent or obvious in the circumstances, um, in all circumstances, or even understandable. Sometimes we don't know exactly how he works. Um, there's a passage in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. It says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And all that's telling us is, hey, you don't see the big picture. I do. I'm going to work this thing out. I'm going to do what my will shares is going to happen. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, people get to do wicked things. And people do wicked things. This whole story here is somewhat wicked to these three, four hundred women, you know, and yet God's going to do this and allow this to perform a bigger work in preserving his people who eventually will bring the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, right, preserve his lineage so that Jesus Christ can come and come and save, provide salvation for each and every one of us. And so, again, we don't see the big picture and ultimately, we know that God's will is going to be done. It says in Romans 11, 33 and 34, I wrote this in the NLT version. It says, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible is it for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? There, and then what I say in response to that and what the Bible says because we can't understand necessarily his will and his way and how he works these things out. Right, looking at this from a secular position or seeing this story unfold, you're like, where is this going? How is this fair? All that, ultimately, God's will is going to be done. He'll be just and considered righteous when it happens, why he's going through it and all that stuff. Um, and we may not understand it, but what the Bible teaches us is we just need to walk in faith, not by sight. And this kind of explains some of the situations we can find ourselves in. And we might not see what's going on. We might be too focused on the circumstances and not on Jesus Christ. And we need to just trust in him. Going back to Romans 8, 28, he works all things together for good to those who loved and are called according to his purpose. So we need to rest in that. And I can't imagine, you know, Mordecai's um, in this situation begging, I imagine, the Lord. Oh, well, we don't know that. We don't know. I, you never see necessarily his relationship with God. But hoping that um, Esther gets chosen. 
um, and that she's not made part of the harem. And well, actually, I don't know where he wanted her to be, but I can't imagine that would be the life that he, he would want for his uh, cousin that he raised. That if she was a queen, there would be some influence that she could have, and she did. She got him in a b position where he could basically stop. Well, really, I, I say all this that they're doing all this, but again, it, it's God's hand in this situation. And so we need to trust. When we say walk, therefore walk by faith. Faith is just the idea of believing. It's the idea of trusting. Trust in, rely on, cling to, um, despite their circumstances. And that's what we'll learn as we go through this whole book of Esther. God's not mentioned, but yet you see his work being done to preserve his people. And again, sometimes we don't see what he's doing in our lives, but understand he is working, right? His job, what he wants for us is to be conformed into his image. And that's what he's working in each and every one of us. And sometimes we need discipline. Sometimes we need to go through some rough things in order for us to grow in character. And that's what he desires for us then we should accept it. And I know that's hard to say, right? It brings me back to James 1 where it says, you know, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I wish I would hoop and holler every time I find myself in a trial. I'm not there yet. Um, but I have seen growth in my life where I know that God's doing something bigger than I can see. And I trust him in order to help me get through it and get past it. Not every time. I wish I could say every time, but again, you know, sometimes I'm trying to do it to myself. Um, but yet, I know God's faithful, and there's a bigger principle that he's trying to develop in me or, you know, work in somebody else's life in the midst of my trial. So with that, hope you find some comfort in that. Um, with that, let's uh, finish in prayer. We are done. Um, Lord, just thank you again for the book of Esther, and uh, just thank you what you show us, your work. And we know and can confirm just by what you've done for each and every one of us. You demonstrated your love for us that while we were sinners, you died for us. And Lord, just as, just as we can know that you did that for us, we can know that you're working in our lives because that's what you share with us. Lord, I just thank you for that. Thank you for being there for each and every one of us as we're, you know, we find ourselves in some trials. Lord, help us to just focus on you. Help us in these trials to glorify you. Help the whole situation to glorify you, even if we can't see how it can. Lord, just help it. Just help us to rest in you and allow it to glorify you. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. And we all say, amen. Amen. Will you get um, my wife to turn that real quick? Mm -hmm. Thanks.